This morning we want to talk about the birth of Jesus Christ. And uh, you know, at, at Christmas time we celebrate Christ and we celebrate the birth of Christ. Uh, and um, one of the things over the years I, I like to do is I like to kind of get things right, amen? Uh, years ago I got into studying the Jewish roots of Christianity. And if you've done that at all, uh, and if you're honest with yourself, it can drive you crazy at times. Um, there's great richness in our Jewish roots and our history. Um, we have 2,000 years, <laughs> 2,000 years approximately, since a wedge was driven between Christianity and, and our Jewish roots, and that was through the Emperor Constantine, who was very anti-Semitic, hated the Jewish people, and wanted to get rid of Jewish people in Christianity at all, completely. And from that time, we have uh, lost a lot of our foundation, and uh, we are, well, let's say we're not lost, it's, we kind of entered into the Dark Ages, and after that eventually, and fell into where we didn't even know about salvation and so on. And there's been a great awakening in, in Christendom in recent years to rediscover uh, our foundation and going back to our Jewish roots. I mean, our Messiah is Jewish, the 12 apostles are Jewish, the scriptures are Jewish, and uh, that is the problem because we're not Jewish. We're, West we're Westerners. Now, so what has happened over the years for the last 2,000 years, because we've come out of European Christianity and Western civilization, and you, you know, in the early church for the first 30 years of Christianity, it wasn't called Christianity, it was called the way, it was, uh, and so on. Many people called they're in the way and called them, uh, at Antioch, the first term Christians was used as a description of Christ followers, which was the, the Greek term for Messiah. And it was, from that time forward, Christianity kind of became identified, at least in that world, as a, as a Jewish sect of Christ followers. And, and from that time we saw after more and more Gentile believers began to be saved, uh, the Gentiles started pouring into the synagogues and becoming Christians, following after Messiah. And so as time went on, the church world became a lot more Gentile uh, oriented and the Jewish roots of, uh, and the Jewishness of, of the Christian faith kind of became background. Uh, up until Gentiles really began to become the dominant part of the church, everybody was Jewish. And so the Christians, I mean the Jews, when they got saved, when Paul and all the apostles got saved, they didn't stop being Jewish. They still went to the temple. They still kept the feast of the Lord. They still kept the kosher laws and so on and so forth. And, uh, but after Gentiles came in and people moved away from Jerusalem, the church, like it always does in cultures, the biggest issue we always face is trying to keep the culture out of the church. And by the time Christ wrote the, uh, we see the revelation of Jesus Christ at the end of the New Testament, um, we see a lot of the world in the church. We see a lot of the same things we face today in the church going on then. Now, we may go, well, yeah, we Gentiles, we got it all wrong, and if we just go back to being Jewish, we'd get it right. Well, in case you didn't notice, the Jewish people didn't get it right either. They had their own problems for many, many, many years. So, but praise be to God, in the person of Christ, our Messiah, He is reconciling the two, bringing us together. There's neither male nor female, bond nor free, Jew or Gentile, we are all one in Messiah. And one day, praise be to God, we will be united Jew and Gentile in the person of Christ when he comes to set up his millennial kingdom. Amen? Praise be to God. But uh, one of the things we have to recognize is in some of the things we do, they definitely have some traditions that have come in that really aren't scriptural. And uh, you know, we're not going to stop having manger scenes and we're, we're not going to tear down our Christmas trees. I went through all that for a season, like maybe we should get rid of Christmas trees because they have pagan origins. Maybe we shouldn't have Christmas lights because they have pagan origins, all this stuff. Uh, well, pretty much you wouldn't have any Western civilization left either. And anybody who really knows anything, the Jewish people had a lot of Judaism has a lot of pagan origins in it. I heard Dennis Prager, who I listen to a lot and think he's a really wise guy and he's a, a Jewish gentleman. He said, you know, one of the things that we have to recognize is Christianity redeems things. 
It takes what the culture has that's dark and dead, and it turns it into something that is redeemable. So praise be to God, let's consider the Christmas tree a redeemable thing. And let's consider what the pagan culture has stolen as something redeemable. Um, you know, so praise be to God, I think we can get into one ditch or the other, and neither one is wise. Amen. Praise be to God. But I wanted this morning just kind of go over the birth of Christ and maybe share with you some things that maybe you didn't know about the birth of Christ from a historical perspective. You know, one of the things we see in the New Testament is when sermons were given in the New Testament, for instance, when the, when the apostles were called before the Sanhedrin, when, um, when uh, Philip, um, or, or excuse me, Stephen, before he was martyred, he gave a historical sermon, G David, I mean, Jesus, uh, sorry, Peter on the day of Pentecost, the very first sermon preached after the Holy Spirit was poured out was a historical sermon. And what do I mean by that? Well, the, the preachers of those sermons went back and they recited his, Israel's history and how God had dealt with Israel and called them out of bondage and how Israel had rebelled and fallen into darkness and how then God sent forth different things to bring them back to himself and eventually how Christ came as their Messiah. So we see, we would call those historical sermons. In other words, they're recounting history. And really that's what the Bible is. The Bible is his story. History is his story story. The Bible is a historical book. It's a book of God's dealing with humanity, God's creation of the world, God creating humans in the world, human beings rebelling against God, and yet God having a provision to bring human beings and the whole world back to himself. So from the book of Genesis to the very first chapter of the book of Revelation to the end of the book, it is a story that reveals God's plan and God's purposes and God's wonderful uh, desire. And one day, uh, uh, he will restore what was lost in the book of Genesis and restore it to its fullness with Christ coming to rule and reign upon the earth as the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. Amen. Praise be to God. So I want to take you back in history a lot of times because one of the things when we think of Christmas from a Western perspective is a lot of people think that Jesus just suddenly appeared on the scene. Like, Oh, Jesus is here. And a lot of times people have a hard time reconciling the God of the Old Testament with the God of the New Testament. A lot of times people see the God of the Old Testament as a wrathful, vengeful God, and the God of the New Testament under Jesus as a merciful, compassionate type of God. But really they're the same God. John made this very clear in his, the Gospel of John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God, and without Him or aside from Him, nothing was made that was made. All things were made by Him. John ties the two covenants together in the person of Christ, and he's preaching to people because the Gospel of John is called the Gospel of a Belief. And John is trying to point out, the author of John is trying to point out that we need to believe that Jesus is Almighty God. So Jesus didn't suddenly become God. Jesus always has been God. The baby born in a manger was as much God as he ever was. But God became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten Son of the Father. And John goes on and says, No man has ever seen God, but the only begotten Son who is in the very intimate presence of the Father, he hath declared him. In other words, he's led him out for everybody to see. So the two things Christ came to do. He came to seek and to save the lost, and he came to show us the Father. That's why Jesus said, uh, or excuse me, Jesus, I meant, I think I said John, but Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, everything I do, I only do what my Father does. I only say what my Father says. So Christ is the greatest example of God Almighty in human form that we could ever see. So he is our template. His earthly ministry is our template, and what he did is our template. So we take Christ and we supersede, we superimpose Christ over all of the readings of the New Testament. And thank God, that's why it's such a great time to be alive. It's so great to live under New Testament covenant rather than just Old Testament because we have the key that unlocks the door to all the Old Covenant. 
We have the key, which is Christ, who is the one that opens up the mysteries of, of the revelation of all those feasts of the Lord and the sacrifices and, the, and all the covenants. They're all pointing to one person. They're all types and shadows and foreshadowings of the Messiah who would one day come. That's why Paul said that to this day when Moses is led or read, there remains a veil over the people. Why? Because that veil is taken away in Christ. Why? That makes so much sense that God would use Paul to reveal this amazing revelation to us because Paul was so well versed in the Torah and the Old Covenant. So when he had Christ, the key that unlocked the door, it became an explosion of revelation to Paul how God in, in Christ was finalizing everything he began from the time that he made human beings on this earth. Amen. Praise be to God. So. I had a teacher in Bible school, a very wise teacher that taught, said this, and it always stuck with me, and it's great to remember this uh, regarding the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And this is how he said it. He said, the new is in the old contained, yet the old is through the new explained. So all the New Testament teachings, everything Jesus taught, everything the apostles taught, we're all in the Old Covenant. So everything Jesus taught, He didn't come teaching something brand new that had never been taught before. Now in one place He said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. But contextualizing that, what was He really saying? Well, the Bible tells us that the commandment, as Jesus said in His earthly ministry, when somebody came along and said, what's the greatest commandment? And He said, love the Lord your God, with all your heart, soul, you know, the greatest commandment is the first one, to love God. And he said the second commandment is like it. Well, if you go into the, the Torah, there's 613 commandments, boiled down into 10 commandments, or literally some people say they're 10 sayings. And those 10 commandments are divided into two parts. The first part of the commandment is our relationship with God, and the second part of those 10 commandments is our relationship with each other. So when Jesus said the first commandment is love God and the second commandment is love your neighbor, he was basically summarizing the entire old covenant in one statement, that the law of God is the law of love. If you love God, you'll keep his commandments. If you love people, you'll keep the commandments of God. You won't lie for, about your neighbor. You won't covet your neighbor's property. You won't murder or you won't steal, you won't do all of those things because you love. And the Bible says, owe no man anything but to love him. And, and later on, we see that all of the commandments are fulfilled in the fulfillment of walking in love. Amen. Praise God. So, Jesus is the key that unlocks all of these old covenant mysteries. And so, when Christ came to the earth, you realize that when Jesus came to the earth, lived a life among us, was crucified, and then rose again from the dead on the third day, he fulfilled over 300 Bible prophecies. Now that's amazing, because these Bible prophecies, you know, if somebody fulfilled just a few Bible prophecies, that would be supernaturally spectacular. But Christ fulfilled well over 300 prophecies in his birth, his life, and his resurrection. So I want to take you back in history a little bit, because again, when we think of Christmas, a lot of people, again, disassociate the Old Covenant God with the New Covenant God, but they're one God. Christ was there in the beginning. So when you see God pouring out His wrath upon Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone, guess who that was? It was Jesus Christ. Because He and His Father are one, the triune Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Christ was there. When you see the children of Israel passing through the Dead Sea and the, 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 through the Red Sea on, on dry ground, that's Jesus Christ with the Father. Everything in the Old Covenant, Christ is there. The problem with people interpreting the Old Covenant many times and the acts of God is they interpret it from a Western perspective, they interpret it from a modern day perspective instead of re interpreting it from an Old Covenant or a cultural or a uh, contextualizing it. Uh, my wife and I were talking about this the other day, that when people see old covenant things like slavery or what we look at is like this is unfair treatment of other people. If we look at it just in an isolated instance by itself, it may seem that God was a bit racist or God was a bit wrathful or so on and so forth. But what people fail to realize is they need to look around the, at the other cultures 
And when you don't realize really what was happening in the other nations, then you'll think maybe God was a bit harsh. But when you look at how people were treated in other nations, in the Canaanite nation, in these nations that God was driving out before the children of Israel, there's a reason God was getting rid of them. They were wicked, they were evil, and they had no mercy on people. Amen. So when you take things in perspective, you start realizing that what God was telling His people was really something very revolutionary, and He was teaching them things that in the context of where they were mentally, that was all they could handle. I had a conversation with a guy a while back, and he brought up some snotty remark about Christianity and how Christianity promotes slavery, and you know, God promoted slavery in the Old Covenant, and so on and so forth. And I said, well, the only reason you object to that at all, at all is because you were raised in this day and age. If you were raised back a thousand years ago, you would have probably had slaves yourself and thought nothing of it. Because until Christianity came on the scene, everybody had slaves. And everybody thought slavery was fine. It was Christianity that really brought the notion that people are created in the image of God after God's likeness, and no one has a right to own another human being who is valuable to God. That was a revolutionary concept that did not exist before Christianity. So yes, there are Christians that promoted slavery because they didn't know the truth, they were stupid, <laughs> but it was Christianity that brought freedom from slavery and brought the concept of freedom from slavery. Every one of the abolitionists in the United States and in England were Christians, every one of them. Amen. So their message is not about slavery, but I'm trying to bring out a little context, context this morning. So let's go back in time a little bit. Let's go back in the Old Covenant because there's this period from the book of Malachi to the book of Matthew that's called the intertestamental period. It's about 400 years. And so when we get to Jesus, a lot of times we'll start these Jesus movies, you know, about the birth of Christ. And Because the Bible doesn't really go into detail. In a lot of areas, the Bible doesn't give us great detail about all the things that are in the details. It gives us what we really need to know. So when you look at the New Testament, all the New Testament writers don't go into a dissertation of the history of Israel and how it came to be that Rome ended up ruling over them, right? So sometimes we don't really know how did this all come about. So I want to take you back a little bit this morning to Solomon, King Solomon, who was the son of David. Now David, remember the story of David who killed Goliath, who eventually became the greatest king in Israel's history, the conquering king, who had a desire to build a temple for God, but God said, no, you're a man of blood and warfare, and you shall not build me a temple, but your son will build me a temple. So, uh, David has an affair in a time of carnality with, with Bathsheba, and ends up having a child, first child dies. Solomon comes along later, and I believe that it was David's way of paying back or reconciling with Bathsheba to make sure her son became the king of Israel. Justice. So Solomon becomes the next king of Israel after David. David had stored up a lot of wealth to put toward the temple, and then Solomon is born, David dies, Solomon becomes the next king of Israel. And Solomon is given this amazing gift and revelation of God of wisdom. And Solomon, under his kingship, Israel reaches the pinnacle of its majesty. Solomon is considered one of the greatest kings in history. He is definitely by far the richest man in history. When you look at the wealth that was brought to Solomon and his kingdom, literally by today's standards, they delivered dump truck loads of gold and silver to Solomon. Dump truck loads putting it in very plain English. That's how much gold he received on an annual basis. It was amazing. Tons of gold. The Bible says that Solomon made gold so plenteous in Israel that silver was considered as gravel. Now, brother, Solomon was a rich, 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 rich man. Now, Solomon builds the temple. It's considered an amazing feat. It's absolutely gorgeous, and it is the pinnacle of Israel's relationship with God. God's glory fills the temple when the priests dedicate it and the power of God enters the temple and it becomes the centerpiece of Jewish culture, Jewish civilization and their worship to Yahweh. Now the problem with Solomon is he doesn't follow his own advice. God specifically tells the children of Israel, tells the kings you are not to intermarry with other kings. 
uh, your, uh, other people from other tribes, you're not to give your daughters a marriage, and you're not to take their daughters a marriage to your sons, and so on and so forth. Solomon disobeys that. Solomon marries, has 700 wives at one time. Now, most of those wives, of course, were treaties and uh, agreements between kings and bargaining and so on and so forth. But the Bible tells us that Solomon, in all of his wisdom, was led astray by outlandish women. What does that mean? It means those pagan women who are brought into his harem end up leading Solomon into idol worship. Solomon actually is responsible for Judah's downfall because Solomon was the one that opened the door to idol worship. Now, would they have done it anyhow? Perhaps, but Solomon certainly did that. And when we look at the book of Ecclesiastes, which we did a study of on Wednesday night a while back, Ecclesiastes is kind of like Solomon singing the blues. It's Solomon looking back at his life after he finally comes to his senses and repents as an older man and recognizes that everything I did, everything I accomplished, and all the wisdom I had, and all the wealth I gained, and all my fame and notoriety, without God it is a waste of time because in the end I'm going to die. And once I'm dead, somebody else is going to take it, and I have no control over what happens. So Solomon comes to the conclusion of this. The whole duty of God is, the whole duty of man is to keep, seek God and keep his commandments, to love God and keep his commandments. So Solomon repents toward the end of his life, comes to his senses, writes the book of Ecclesiastes, but we get a lot of wisdom from Solomon. Now after Solomon dies, unfortunately because of Solomon's wealth and gaining wealth and all of his exploits, he taxes the people very heavily. And by the time Solomon dies, his son Rehoboam takes over the throne. And Rehoboam's kind of a young man. I'm not sure of his age. I haven't really looked at that for a while. But Rehoboam, by earthly standards, is rather young. And uh, the people come to, to Rehoboam and said, you know, your father scourged us uh, with briars or something along that line. He said, if you'll ease the tax burden on us, if you'll lighten up, uh, we will be your loyal servants. Well, Rehoboam goes to the elderly counselors of Solomon, and they say, yeah, lighten the tax burden, the people will be loyal to you. But like a young ruler, and not a lot of sense sometimes, he goes to his young friends, and his friends said, no, just pour it on, they're just being a bunch of rebels. So Rehoboam does that, and he says, my father scourged you with this, I'm going to scourge you with scorpions. And the ten tribes of Israel, the ten northern tribes, says, to your tents. In other words, we're not going to serve you. And so they literally break away from the nation of Israel, and Jeroboam leads the ten tribes of the north to the north, to Samaria, sets up another kingdom that we later know is called Ephraim, or Israel. So the, it, the kingdom is split between two kingdoms. We have the northern kingdom of Israel, and from that day forward, Israel is called as a northern kingdom, and Judah is called the southern kingdom. And and Judah has two tribes. We have the tribe of, of uh, Benjamin and the tribe of Judah. And those are the only two tribes and in the temple. Well, God prophesies to Jeroboam and says, if you will follow me and serve me, I'll make you a great leader, a great king. But what happens is by the time the feasts of the Lord come about and the men are required to go down to Jerusalem to worship, Jeroboam gets scared and he says, well, if they go down there to Jerusalem, they'll never come back and I'll lose my entire kingdom. So he sets up a golden calf and leads the entire nation of the northern tribes into idol worship. And because of that, his lineage and himself, he is killed and his lineage is cut off and he loses his entire lineage, which is the greatest detriment anybody and the greatest judgment could be upon any family. Um, and so the northern kingdom of Israel becomes the capital of Samaria. And the northern kingdom intermarries with other nations around, and they become wicked idolaters. They fall into Baal worship, and it reaches its pinnacle under Ahab, uh, the king Ahab, and uh, Jezebel, who literally goes on a rampage to slaughter all of the prophets of God and kill the people of God. So let me just interject something. The ten tribes, there are people in those ten tribes that are very loyal to God. They're not idolaters. So when a lot of this stuff starts happening, what do they do? They begin to depart from that kingdom and they go back to Jerusalem to the true worship of God. So we find that God sends prophets and warns them and says, if you don't turn from your idolatry and wickedness, I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to send nations against you. Now the sad commentary is the northern kingdom never has a single good king. Every single king of the northern kingdom is a reprobate. Every single one is wicked. And God is still crying out to them. God wants to reconcile them. But God eventually tells them, you're going to be taken over. And so what happens is in 721 BCE, before the Common Era, 
The Assyrian Empire, which is one of the top empires of the world at that time, modern-day Iraq is mainly Assyria, be other, king, other nations involved. But Assyria comes in, invades the Northern Kingdom, and hauls away the Northern Kingdom in 721 BCE into captivity, and there is no Northern Kingdom anymore. They're held away captive. Now the refugees run back to Jerusalem, those who are left over, and to the Southern Kingdom. So there is no northern kingdom. We have Assyria now. So we have Judah and Benjamin, the southern kingdom of Judah. And uh, what happens, of uh, Judea, what happens is they have some periods of good times and some periods of bad times. They have some good kings and they have some bad kings. And they fall into areas, of, they never do get completely rid of idolatry. They're always dealing with Asherah poles and, you know, different ungodly deities that God had told them about not to worship. And they had moments of great apostasy and they fell into Baal worship at times and, and eventually God continues to warn them but eventually they become so wicked that God says you have become worse than the nations I drove out before you. They embrace Baal worship eventually and they start sacrificing their children uh, to Moloch and the gods of Baal, God of Baal, and they fall into wicked, wicked idolatry. And finally under Jeremiah, Jeremiah prophesies the Syrian Empire is taken over by, by uh, the Babylonians. Nebuchadnezzar becomes the king of the Assyrian Empire. It's now Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar, of course, one of the greatest kings, the most powerful kings ever. Um, and Jeremiah the prophet, who is a teenager, is called by God to warn the nation of Israel, the nation of Judah, if you don't repent and cooperate with Nebuchadnezzar, he will, he will take over your nation. He is in my hand. I have raised him up as a judgment against you. And of course, they treat him as a, a uh, they think that he's a, a traitor, and they throw him in a pit. It's called the weeping prophet. Uh, but what happens? Well, in 539 B.C., uh, Babylon comes in and conquers Jerusalem and hauls away most of the nation into captivity to Babylon. And God tells them under Daniel, you're going to be there for 70 years, representing all the years that you refuse to keep the Sabbath and honor me in the land. So 70 years of captivity is predicted. Daniel, when he's in, da in Babylon, reads the prophecy of Jeremiah and recognizes why they're there and weeps about it. Now, so what happens is eventually the Medo-Persian Empire invade Babylon after Nebuchadnezzar has died. They invade Babylon, overthrow Babylon in a moment. Babylon falls and it becomes the Medo-Persian Empire. Later the Persians become the predominant empire. And um, in 516 BC, um, Cyrus, the king of Persia, declares under hand of God, supernatural power of God comes upon Cyrus and Cyrus makes a decree that the temple in Jerusalem is to be rebuilt. That's how God can use wicked kings. Isn't that amazing? He's not a godly man. He's a wicked king, an uh, idol worshiper. But God raises up Cyrus and says, you're going to go back and you're going to rebuild the temple. And so what happens? We have Ezra, we have Nehemiah, they're the main drivers of this, and they go back and they build, restart rebuilding the temple. The, the Jerusalem is burnt and there's not a stone left upon another. It's just terrible. The people are impoverished. They're over, they're ridden, uh, driven by, by the governor of the, the area under the Babylonians, and it's just, it's a terrible time. Well, Ezra comes back and starts bringing, trying to bring reform to the people, bring them back to God, and finally in Nehemiah comes back under uh, ruler, and he uh, sets up, and this is the cool thing about Nehemiah, he comes in, you know, says to the king, he said, by the way, we're supposed to rebuild the temple, and you're going to pay for it, and I want you to do everything. <laughs> you know, that'd be like going to somebody who's your enemy and say, hey, uh, I'm going to do this for God, and you're going to pay for it. So it is cool, and Nehemiah comes back, and the book of Nehemiah is a tremendous book about leadership and uh, building for God, and Nehemiah comes back and he's very distraught because the people have fallen into despair, and they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So Nehemiah brings forth, he has great leadership, and he gets the temple rebuilt, uh, they, get the, they get the walls of, of Jerusalem rebuilt in the times of difficulty. It says they built with one hand and they held a sword with the other. So they're having to fight off their enemies while they're building. And they restore, it takes a long time, and they restore uh, and build a new temple. 
And the people that were there who saw the temple of Solomon, they weep because it's not as glorious as the temple of Solomon. But God prophesied and said the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former house. And literally, after the people of God began to come back into Jerusalem, they began to migrate back, Israel literally has some of its greatest revivals and time with God in its history. Now, so let's continue forward here. After the Medo-Persian Empire, later the Persian Empire, in 332 BC, we have Alexander the Great, who is considered one of the greatest rulers in history. He conquers the Medo-Persian Empire, and in doing so, he also conquers Israel. Now, what Alexander the Great does, though, is he allows Israel to have autonomy. He allows them to rule themselves. But later on, Alexander the Great dies. He dies as an alcoholic at a young age, and and his king, his generals divide his kingdom among themselves. And one of the kingdoms that comes out of Alexander's kingdom is called the Seleucid Empire. And under the Seleucid Empire, a ruler rises up who is called Antiochus. Now Antiochus calls him, or Antiochus, he calls himself Antiochus the Epiphanes, or God on earth. We have in Antiochus, in the book of Daniel, Daniel sees Antiochus prophetically, and he prophesies and uses Antiochus as a type of the Antichrist. And he's the greatest type of the Antichrist we have in the entire Bible. And when you look at him and look what he did, he is really, truly a great picture of Antichrist. So Antichrist establishes Hellenism. He says, everybody's going to be Greeks. You're going to talk like Greeks. You're going to act like Greeks. You're going to... You're going to you're going to acclimate to the Greek culture. He comes into Jerusalem, he corrupts the priesthood, the priesthood was, was corrupted, he builds a great big gymnasium across from the temple. The priest, he gives them bunches of money to corrupt the people and make them Greeks, and the, he, he puts Greek uh, leaders or Greek uh, priests in place of the, the Hebrew priests, and Israel falls into Greek culture, but kind of like America, you know, very pagan, uh, we're involved with the culture and we're doing all the things. And so what happens when he comes into uh, Jerusalem, the first thing he does when he establishes this, he comes in and desecrates the temple, slaughters a hog on the altar of the temple, and sets up a statue of Zeus in the temple. Remember Jesus said, when you see the, uh, the, the, the image of desecration in the temple, run for the hills? Well, this is a great type of this. And he commands any of everybody that you cannot keep the Torah of God. And if you're found keeping the commandments of God, you are slaughtered. And multiple, hundreds of thousands of Jews lost their life as a result of this. But later on, a group of, uh, of priests from the lineage of Hasmonean, the Hasmonean lineage, or the dynasty, they have in their lineage a guy named Judah Maccabees. And Judah Maccabees is the son of one of these priests, and he leads an army in, re in revolt against the Seleucid Empire, and they drive with an army of about 30,000 men, they conquer an army of about 100,000 men. It's a great victory. They drive the Seleucids out of Jerusalem, and they come into Jerusalem, and they reestablish temple worship. They cleanse the temple, and they, they establish worship to God. And this is where we get the story of Hanukkah from, or the Festival of Lights or Dedication. The word Hanukkah means dedicate. It, so it's the rededication of the temple. And the story goes, uh, they only had enough oil for one day to light the menorah in the temple, but the oil lasted for eight days until they could get the oil made again. And so that's why we celebrate eight days of Hanukkah. So it's a tremendous story of revolution, tremendous story of God's hand. And we see that, in, uh, that Israel literally in 129 BCE, before the common era, 129, Israel literally has its own autonomy. They are independent again. They're ruling themselves, which is awesome. And uh, after, of course, the Seleucid dynasty falls in, uh, actually, the Seleu in 141, I meant, they reestablished their, uh, had the wrong date, 141, they reestablished their, uh, their autonomy. In, one, in 129, uh, the Seleucid Empire falls, and Rome becomes the new kid on the block. Rome becomes the ruling empire. And Rome is very much like Alexander the Great. Rome allowed nations to have autonomy. And so Rome allows the priesthood of Jerusalem to worship God the way they want to worship, 
They don't impose anything as long as you cooperate with us, you pay your taxes, and you do what we want you to do. You can have your worship and worship however you want. Well, what happens? That doesn't last very long. And so in, in uh, 37, before, 37 BCE, uh, there's a rebellion against the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire crushes the rebellion, and they set up their own ruler, Herod the Great, Herod Agrippa. And so from that day forward in 40, 40 BC, Herod becomes the king in Jerusalem. And Herod goes on a great rebuilding campaign. He's a, he's, he's a wicked king, but he's a mighty king, has a lot of wealth, and he rebuilds. He takes the temple, he doesn't rebuild it, but he adds on to the temple, and it's called Herod's Temple. And so that's why it's called, and it's a tremendous structure. He rebuilds more of the walls of Jerusalem, makes bigger and better walls, and so on and so forth. And so Herod is the ruler over that region of Israel under Roman authority. He's kind of like a puppet king under the Roman Empire. So what happens? We fast forward, we come to this point in time that Caesar Augustus sends out a decree that all of the world under his dominion is to be taxed. And so what he wants to do is take a census like a lot of kings do. How many people do I have in my kingdom? You divide how many people by so many taxes. So if you have this many people in your country, this is what you're going to pay me in taxes. So that's what happens. Everybody is commanded. They have to go back to the city of their birth so they can get on the tax rolls so we can know who you are. And so Joseph and Mary come along. And we know the story. We're not going to read the entire story because we don't have time. But let's look here at Luke's Gospel, the second chapter. And uh, I'm going to read here uh, down through verse 20 of this chapter. And it says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census first took place when Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because it was, he was of the house and lineage of David and to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was while they were there that the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ, or Messiah, the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angel had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it was told them. Now let's go over this story a little bit. Now to get the entire narrative of the nativity as told in the New Testament, you have to read the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Matthew, because each one of them emphasizes a different thing, and each one of them goes into different detail about a different thing. But for the sake of time, we're just going to read that portion and go over some of the highlights over it. First of all, Mary was betrothed to, to Joseph. Now, it was common a betrothal in those days, and in Jewish culture, they started betrothing their daughters when they were 12 years old. So it was common for a daughter to betrothed and be married usually by the time she was 16 years old. Young men were betrothed by the time they were 14 to 16 because parents wanted their kids married by the time they were 18. Now, there were two reasons for that. One main reason, they didn't want them to have premarital sex, that's why. 
because they understood when people get older, like we have today, the older people get, the more temptation they're going to have. So they wanted to marry them off right away and avoid immorality. So that was one of the reasons. Now, it was common in the cultures in which they lived. This was a common thing in history. It always has been that young girls were married off at an early age. And there's a couple reasons for that. We find that even in today. If you go over to Tanzania, you go over to other countries in Africa, um, unfortunately, and we're sad to say that women are not treated with the same esteem as men are. And they never have been in history. This is part of the curse that came into the earth. It's part of the fall. And praise be to God, Jesus taught women women and treated women with such respect and gave women such dignity and raised women to a level of esteem that was never before in history. I mean just the fact that Jesus would talk to a woman out in daylight in public at the well was amazing because you did not do that. And we find this cultural thing in, in history. And one of the things I'm going to teach after New Year's here, I'm going to teach about women in ministry. Because there is a misconception among Christians, it's a perpetrated thing that women cannot be in ministry. You know, Paul said, I forbid a woman to teach. That is total misinterpretation. When people say, God, Paul did not let women teach. Women have no business preaching the Word of God and being in ministry. That is such a misinterpretation of that scripture, and it's so shocking chauvinistic and has been perpetrated in Christianity. We're going to blow that garbage out of the water. Uh, women are not second-rate citizens to men in the kingdom of God. And we need to stop treating women that way. That is a cultural thing, and we're going to take it into some context. See, this is what happens when you take things out of cultural context and historical context. You end up creating bad doctrines. And that's a bad doctrine. And we're going to deal with that. And it's going to liberate all the women. So we're going to give you real women's liberation. Amen. Because Jesus was the true liberation of women, not, not modern feminists who hate men and hate God. Amen. So, uh, um, but Mary was betrothed to Jesus. So she was probably married to him by the time she was 14 to 16 years old. Joseph was probably 16 to 17 years old. Now, a betrothal typically lasted one year in a Jewish household. And what happened is it, most marriages were arranged. The parents would arrange a marriage with another suitable uh, person from a, you know, these were of the same tribe, same lineage. And um, the betrothal would last for up to a year. And during that time, it was a time for the bride to begin preparing to be a wife and to be a household keeper and beautify herself and watch for her groom to come. And Jesus gives an entire parable of this experience in the parable of the wise young bridemaids and the foolish bridemaids that we're not going to get into today. But um, some people believe historically that Joseph might have been an older man who was widowed. And uh, he may have been as old as 30 years old, but we really don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. And you may go, oh my gosh, a 30-year-old marrying a 16-year-old. That was very common in the culture. It was very common for older men to marry younger women. If you've ever watched the movie Fiddler on the Roof, you see that. The women, the girls are singing this song, matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. Find me a fine, catch me a catch. And they realized the match I could get might be some old crusty codger as old as my dad, and I sure don't want to be married to him. And so, you know, uh, there's a stark reality of that that's not real good. And I, going back to what I was saying, if you go to other cultures, it's very common for families to marry off their 12-year-old or 13-year-old daughter to some older guy. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not endorsing that. The Bible wouldn't say it's right. But um, it's the reality of the world we live in. Uh, and it's an unfortunate thing. Um, so anyhow, they were betrothed for up to a year. And that betrothal was as good as being married. The only way out of it was death. Um, you were considered just like being married. So what happens? Joseph finds that Mary is pregnant. We don't know how he finds it out, if she tells him or what happens, but Joseph finds out that she's pregnant. Now, to get a divorce, there's two ways you can get a divorce. You can, uh, you can have an open public divorce, for instance, if some guy found and thought his girlfriend had, you know, there's two ways you could either be pregnant, either you were assaulted, you were lured in and assaulted, raped, or you had had a, a relationship outside of marriage. So Joseph is, tells us he's a just man and wanting to put Mary away privately, meaning you could have a private divorce where it wasn't publicized, and you could go and get a letter or a certificate or a writ of divorce and put some away privately. And that's what Joseph wanted to do, because to be a couple of things, he could, you know, if you brought your, your girlfriend, your wife-to-be before a trial, 
She could be stoned to death for committing adultery. Remember Jesus caught the, the they brought the woman caught in adultery to Jesus and they were going to stone her. Which by the way they were in wrong because the man was supposed to be brought before the woman, before them as well. But only the woman was brought. According to the Torah they both were to be brought and they both were to be stoned to death. So they were in the wrong to begin with. Uh, but anyhow, that's not our message this morning. But uh, the other thing, even with this divorce, if she wasn't stoned, she would be subjected to a life of complete ridicule the rest of her life. She would be considered just the scum of the earth. They would literally have these ceremonies where the women would chant at the woman and calling her every name they could think of, just a, calling a curse upon her for being such a reprobate. So Joseph wanted to put her away privately. He didn't want to disgrace her because he was a good man. And the angel of the Lord comes to Joseph and tells him not to divorce his wife, but the, the child in her womb is of the Holy Spirit. So praise be to God. God intervenes. God shows up in the form of an angelic vision and tells Joseph that a child is going to be, this baby is supernatural. Amen. So this brings us up to this question. They're going down to Jerusalem and they're, they're going to, uh, or not to Bethlehem, the, the, the town of Joseph's birth, and Jesus is going to be born. So I know we celebrate 20, the 25th of December as the birth of, Christ, of Jesus, and I have heard some people, Christians, argue that yes, the 25th of December is when Jesus was born, and um, I make no bones about it, it's not true. Jesus was not born on the 25th of December. He was not born anywhere around the 25th of December. So why do we keep celebrating? It's tradition. Um, and uh, you can, you know, I know some Christians, they have a hissy fit. Oh my gosh, we're a bunch of pagans. We're not, you know, get over it. You're not going to change it. You know, you can take your five people off here and we're, we're going to worship God away from 25th of December. Well, good luck with that. I'm going to continue to recognize the 25th. I know the true story, and my faith is not shaken because we celebrate the birth of Christ on the 25th. Uh, do you ever look on your natural calendar? There are certain things that we celebrate that aren't really the original date, but they were changed because of the calendar. Even the Feast of the Lord in Israel have been changed because when they were led away into Babylonian captivity, they didn't have a calendar anymore. So later on, one of the priests established a kind of generic calendar, so no matter where the children of Israel could, were at, they could know what day of the, what, when, what the month was so they could keep the feasts, amen? And celebrate the Lord and keep the Sabbaths. So um, let's go over here to Luke's Gospel and look at this passage just a little bit real quick. In the 8th chapter through the 12th chapter it says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Now this is a clue. It tells us specifically in the text that the shepherds were out in the fields watching their sheep. Now the reason we, don't, we know by just that alone that it was not December 25th is that's not the time of year when shepherds were out in the field watching the sheep. Because in, Jerusalem, in Israel it was very cold that time of year, just like it is here, it's cold. They're not going to have their sheep out in the pastures at that time of year watching them, because it's too cold. It's winter time. So that's not going to happen. And uh, the other thing is if you know anything about sheep, if you look up, you can look this up anywhere, uh, generally sheep are bred from the months of October through December and they just ate for, they have, uh, are pregnant for about eight months. So we're looking at the spring of the year when lambs are born. So this is a clue. Why were they out in the fields watching over their flocks by night? Because it was the spring of the year and it was lambing season. So that gives us a clue. Lambs are born in the spring of the year. There's a, several other things about this that are very interesting. Um, they find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. Swaddling clothes mean they would wrap the child with bandied long strips of cloth. It was very common in those days when you had lambs because you wanted to keep your lamb from dying, they would take long strips of cloth and they would wrap the lamb as well. It was a way to protect their lambs from catching pneumonia and dying. So Jesus was wrapped, the Lamb of God was wrapped like a real lamb in a manger. And again we say they stayed at, uh, I think the, we had a narrative at our Christmas program about this, um, they, it, the Bible uses the term in. And we tend to think he stayed at the Red Roof Inn. Amen. <laughs> but it, Bethlehem was a very small town. 
and it wouldn't have been big enough to have an inn, but it was very common and still is in Jewish culture that when you traveled, you'd stay at a relative's house. Well, what happened? Because so many people were traveling because of the time of year for two reasons, we're gonna look at in a moment. Because of the census, a lot of people were traveling, and so when they got to the relative's house, there was no room left. The only room left was the bottom of the house where they would traditionally, in Jewish homes and homes at that time, they would keep animals in the bottom. So they had two level houses. The top was where you lived, or you might have even three stories. The top is where you lived, and the bottom is where you kept your animals. It's kind of like an, one of those garages you have under your house, but theirs was full of animals. So they would keep their animals down there, and Jesus was born and placed in a feeding trough, which generally was carved out of stone. So he was placed in an animal feeding trough and, uh, and uh, kept there, and that's where they came and saw him. So the, the shepherds here, the angels appear to the shepherds, and the shepherds go to see what this is. Now, the interesting thing about lambs, and it's interesting that God specifically, you know, why didn't God send the, the angels to somebody else? Why does he specifically send the angels to shepherds? Shepherds are the first people that hear about this, according to the narrative. Why? Because they're watching lambs. Shepherds are familiar with lambs. Shepherds are familiar with sheep. So I think it's an honor to the shepherds for God to call them to come to Jerusalem. Number one, they're out there and they're available, but that's not the only reason. I think because he is lamb, they, he wants them to come and see the true lamb of God who comes and takes away the sins of the world. Now, the other thing about these lambs is Bethlehem was actually the town where they kept the temple lands. There was a specific flock of lambs in Bethlehem that they kept and they raised for temple sacrifices. So if you went to Jerusalem on Passover and you were to have a lamb and you didn't bring your lamb with you because a lot of people didn't because it was a long way to travel and you didn't want to necessarily bring a lamb all the way because what if something happened to it on the way or it wasn't accepted when you got there because maybe it had a blemish you didn't know because the priest had to inspect the lambs before you could have the lambs, you know, Passover lamb. So they raised temple lambs, and there was, was a large flock of lambs, so people would often go and they'd buy lambs at the temple, and they had to be a lamb without spot, without blemish of a year old. And of course, they raised those. And of course, the priest who sacrificed the lambs on the temple mount. So it's interesting that the Lamb of God, the Father, the earthly Father that God chooses to be Jesus' earthly Father uh, while He's on the earth is, is the one He's going to entrust his son to is from the tribe of Judah, from the town of Bethlehem, the lineage of David, and um, praise be to God, and God leads him down to Bethlehem where the lambs are born. Now this is a clue as well. If it's in the spring of the year, one of the things this tells us is that more than likely because there were so many people traveling, it wasn't just because of the census it was Passover season. Because lambs were born in the spring of the year, and this would bring us to the month of Nisan, which is the first month in Jewish, cal in the biblical calendar, the month of Nisan, which means the word Nisan literally means beginning. So, if you think about the earthly ministry of Jesus, and I've talked quite a few times on the Feast of the Lord, and you're always learning new things about these, they're quite fascinating. But if you look at the Feast of the Lord, they're divided into two parts. The first part is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, Passover, Fruit Striped Fruits, and the Day of Pentecost. Those feasts all take place in the spring of the year. And then we have a lull and we have what we call the Fall Feast of the Lord, the, the Feast of Ingathering. Uh, we have the Feast of Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot, which is uh, um, uh, the, the Day of God, where they'd build booths, also called the Feast of Booths. And uh, if you look at the earthly ministry of Jesus, he fulfilled the spring feast of the Lord as the Lamb of God to the very day. On the 14th day of the first month of Nisan, and in the book of Exodus here, uh, Exodus chapter 12, and uh, we'll wrap this up, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, the month shall, This month shall be the beginning of your months, it shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth month, 
a tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbors next to him uh, take this lamb and so forth. And then they're to take and they're to eat the lamb roasted in, in fire. They're to eat the entrails. They're to take the blood of the lamb and they're to put it on the doorpost and the mantle of their house. So that when the destroyer comes, he sees the blood and passes over. So in other words, that is a type of the blood of the Messiah. It's the first Passover. It's called the Lord's Passover. It says, for the Lord will pass over and not allow the destroyer to enter your house and kill you. And we know that in Egypt there was not a home where there wasn't a firstborn die. Right? So, um, what happens, this is the beginning of the Jewish calendar. Now I know the Jewish people in Israel, they, they celebrate um, the Day of Trumpets or Rosh Hashanah as the New Year. But from a biblical perspective, that is not their new year. That is the, the biblical new year, according to the Bible, is Nisan. And Israel has two calendars. They have a civic calendar and they have a biblical calendar. Now, unfortunately, the nation doesn't always observe the biblical calendar. Orthodox and practicing Jews do. But according to the Bible, Nisan is the first day of the month. It's the prophetic calendar. So Jesus, I believe, is born during the month of Nisan. Now the, the Jewish calendar, the biblical calendar, is a lunar calendar, not a solar calendar. So a month begins at the first sighting of the sliver of the new moon in Jerusalem at the temple. And then it reaches its fulfillment at a particular cycle on the moon. So the word Nisan means beginning. And so the interesting thing, if you go in a lunar cycle, by the 14th of the day, the 10th of the day and the 14th, you would enter into the full moon cycle by then. So they were to take the lamb for a household on the 10th of the month. They were to keep it for three days and on the evening on the 14th, because a, a day goes by, you know, at sundown, wherever you're at, that's the beginning of a new day. That's how the days, and it's kind of hard to keep your mind wrapped around this from our perspective because our new day starts at midnight. A biblical day starts at the sun setting till the next sun sets. That's a biblical day. And so it's a little hard to, you know, keep this straight sometimes. So if you think about it, Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on a, a colt on the very day that the lambs were being selected. It was called Lamb Selection Day, or in the Hebrew literally meant, some, one of the ways it could be terp interpreted as ham, accepting the lamb. You'd go down and you accept that lamb for your sacrifices. So on the very day that the priest would make this big processional and there were thousands of people in Jerusalem with palm fronds and, and greenery worshiping God and celebrating the return of Messiah, on the very time the priests were going to come into Jerusalem riding, they were going to walk with the lambs and, and they were going to celebrate and all the people before they come in, Jesus circumvents them and comes in before them and all the people begin shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They start giving him the decree Messiah, prophetically so. So Jesus becomes the Lamb of God. He's the Lamb of God. So this is what I believe. I believe that Jesus was either born on Nisan 10 or he was born on Nisan 14. He was born during Passover. Wouldn't it make sense if he fulfilled Passover to the day, he would be born on Passover? Why? Because he would have been a year old when the next Passover comes around. Jesus, uh, the Lamb of God. Um, so uh, we don't have time to go into more of that. I'm, going to give you just a couple more tidbits here this morning before we wrap this up. Uh, I used to believe, and I'd heard some teaching, that Jesus may have been born during the Feast of Tabernacles, and I actually taught that, but then I got to be thinking about it and really processing this. This couldn't have been, because the, the fall feast of the Lord will be fulfilled when Jesus returns. And if he fulfilled all the first feasts of the Lord, the spring feast of the Lord, while his first coming, it wouldn't make any sense for him to fill to be born on the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles is the culmination of the ages. It's when Christ returns to tabernacle, God with us. That's why he's called Emmanuel, God with us. One day he will come back as the King of Kings to dwell with us. So praise be to God.
Now it tells us in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that they might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son, and of a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So in the fullness of time, at the very time, when you start looking at all of these things, how God arranged the history of the world for certain times and seasons, it is really truly amazing. The fact that Rome ruled that region of the world is amazing in and of itself because everybody spoke Greek. So you could communicate to one another. It was easy to preach the gospel because you could preach Greek to people and people would understand it. This is one thing Alexander the Great did. He literally created a street language Greek. It was called the Koine Greek language. He did it so he could communicate to all of his different legions of soldiers. And so the Bible is really represented not in classical Greek, but in the street language Greek is what it's really represented as. Now, one other thing I want to throw in here, and that is the Magi, or the wise men. Because traditionally, what do we do? We see the three wise men bearing gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which, by the way, represents the three parts of Christ. Gold for a king, frankincense for a priest, and myrrh for his burial. Um, which every household that had the wealth to do it would buy a, a canister of myrrh for embalming when you died. Very valuable. And they presented Jesus with gold, frankincense, and myrrh, the Bible says. Well, we often see, we see three wise men, and we tend to think, well, there's three wise men. The Bible doesn't tell us how many wise men. One thing for sure I can guarantee you, when you see movies and there's three guys riding across the desert on a camel, there's no way three kings are riding across the desert on a camels with just the three of them cold, carrying gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Very, that'd be like Fort Knox, brother. Okay, we're just going to set out across here even though there are robbers, uh, they would have had a whole caravan of armed soldiers with them. Now, one Syriac manuscript believes that there could have been 12 to uh, a minimum of 12 magi and possibly multiple dozens of magi. So this is a huge caravan. It's a big deal. When it comes into, into Jerusalem, everybody's like, wow, look at these guys. They're, they're kings. <coughs> the final question is, where'd they come from? Well, some people believe that they were Babylonian uh, astronomers or astrologers they were obviously astrologers they were they were soothsayers they looked at the stars but somewhere along the line they got a hold of the Jewish scriptures and they knew that there was a king going to be born in Israel now again this is an interesting dichotomy because on the one hand we're forbidden to foretell the future we're forbidden to look at the stars you know the horoscopes are ungodly that that's paganism and we're forbidden to do that of course we shouldn't have anything to do with that stuff but these guys are literally watching the stars and there's a particular star, it's named the King Star. And when they see the King Star pass through a certain particular constellation, that we don't have time to go into that because that's a whole big thing in and of itself. But they see this star called the King Star, and when they see it, they know that it's a prophecy fulfilled. And they hear the word of the Lord that this is where he is going to be. So they begin to follow the star. Now, there's an interesting movie a guy made a while back about this star, that there was a certain constellation in the sky and a certain time in history where the, the stars literally changed their alignment. It's quite a fascinating movie. The other uh, documentary about this, it's quite interesting. The other possibility is the star they followed was an angel of God, because, you know, stars generally don't move. But it's one of those two. And they follow the star, and they come to Bethlehem. And uh, we know that they enter the city, and they go to Herod. And Herod says, well... When you find this child, let me know so I too may come and worship him. And we know Herod has no intention of worshiping. But um, we know that when they come to see Jesus, he's two years old. He's not a baby in a manger anymore. They show up and he's two years old because it tells us he's in the house. They come and visit him. He's a two-year-old. It takes him two years to get there. They come and visit him. He's two. So there's no, there's no magi at the manger scene. So whenever you see that... It looks good on Christmas cards, but it's not biblical. <laughs> and, you know, the typical manger scene looks good on Christmas cards, but it's also not biblical. So, uh, uh, just so you have the, the rest of the story and the real story. So, what happens? The Magi go back. Uh, they're going to go back and tell Herod, but they're warned by an angel, do not go because Herod means to do the child harm. So, they depart another way. And later on, Herod finds out and he's infuriated. And what does he do? He sends a decree out to every boy, every male is to be killed two years old.
So he goes and he has all the two-year-olds slaughtered in Bethlehem. Why didn't he kill all the babies? Because he knows the child's two years old. So Jesus is in the house when he's two, and Jesus' parents, of course, are, are warned in a dream to flee into Egypt uh, to, to escape the wrath of the king and so on and so forth. So if we think about this, historically we know, you know, we look at our calendar uh, before Christ, and we think that Christ, people think that Christ was born at zero because, okay, from the time of zero up, that's the life and ministry of Christ. But truly, that's not true. What we really know from history is that Christ was more than likely born in 6 BCE, or the number 6 before zero, the common era. He was definitely not born in zero. Um, and it, we can figure this out for a couple ways. One, we, can, we know the exact year that Herod died. The, uh, uh, we have historical account of the year uh, that Herod died, and I have it here somewhere in my notes. Uh, 4 B.C., I think, is... Uh, I think he died in 4 B.C. Um, B.C.E. Uh, so if we go back two years from that, and two years from the time the Magi arrive, we look at Jesus being born somewhere probably in 6 BCE. Um, so he was not born, we don't know emphatically he was born in 6 BCE, but he definitely was not born at 0 BC. So uh, anyhow, those are some interesting tidbits I wanted to just throw out to you about the Christmas story. So now when you see a traditional nativity scene, it'll ruin you for life because you know it's not true. And it's okay, we celebrate, we'll continue to have We'll continue to celebrate the baby scene of Jesus in the manger, but it's good to know that that's not really how it happened. The truth is, these are the details, and why are they important? Because there's so much more depth to this story when we add in these significant factors than what we commonly hear in Christmas. And, and so when you start adding up the supernatural way God aligned things for these all to come to pass at prophetic moments, it truly becomes such an amazing story. It's so much more amazing than just the typical pictures we have of Christmas that, that really sometimes are really shallow. When, but when we think of the significance of these things and how God made it all come about, it's just absolutely mind-bending that God, before creation, had this all planned out to the very day and hour.